In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of Amen. 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 Our, uh, we don't have a feast for today, but it's a commemoration, and that is of St. Um, St. Francis of Assisi and the occasion of uh, his receiving of the stigmata. Uh, the stigmata, as we know, is the physical marks in, in uh, a person, a saint's body, uh, like our Lord's passion, the marks in the hands and the feet, uh, the wounds in the side, uh, and occasionally other wounds. Uh, but we'll, we'll see a little bit about that. Uh, but this occurred, if we know, St. Francis was born in the year 1181, and he died in 1226. And two years previous, uh, he received the stigmata. Uh, he was on a mountain in fasting and prayer and received a vision uh, of an angel, uh, which, which left him with the imprint of the stigmata. Uh, now, this was uh, quite significant in that it hadn't happened. Uh, it hadn't happened. Like it was just it. It had never happened before. Uh, nobody was familiar with this phenomena, and it was uh, quite a source of wonderment. Uh, St. Bonaventure, uh, the, the theologian, uh, was a Franciscan himself, would write, write the um, account of this, the life of St. Francis, and he would say that it, it, was, it was almost a scandal at the beginning because people were on just so unfamiliar uh, with what had happened. Uh, but this, the reason it has the term stigmata, like, we're familiar, oh, the stigmata, of course, where did they come from? Right, why do we use that term? Well, it's from today's reading, the epistle, which is St. Paul to the Galatians. And St. Paul is speaking about uh, circumcision and how at the, um, among the, the early converts, you know, these, these Catholics in the very first century, St. Paul is, is making these converts to Christ. And Judaizers are coming along and telling them, you have to be circumcised. You have to be marked uh, as, you know, uh, with, with this, this physical mark. And St. Paul says, that's, that's not our glory. Our glory is not in the flesh. And even tells them, you know, you, the mark in your flesh is their glory. These Judaizers were counting like, oh, how many did you circumcise? How many did you, right? It was like kind of like their, uh, their, their numbering of their converts. And St. Paul says, our, my glory is in the cross of Christ alone. Uh, and then he says something interesting. He says, but I, um, let no man trouble me further, for I bear in my body the marks of our Lord Jesus. And that's Galatians 6.17. And the word he used, marks, he uses the word uh, stigmata. And in Greek, uh, that actually is the word they used when they brand cattle. They, they make a mark on the cattle signifying who owns that particular beast, right? So the stigmata is kind of like a mark of ownership. Uh, quite, quite the honor indeed, we can see. So it's not known, right? The people didn't even think about it. St. Paul says, I carry the marks of our Lord in my body. They thought maybe, well, he was scourged, he was beaten, he was stoned, you know, he was shipwrecked. So he must be talking about these, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the sufferings for Christ, right? For 1,200 years, that is what was supposed. And then this happens to St. Francis. And of course, what do we do when something extraordinary happens to somebody? We go to scripture and we say, do we find anything like this in scripture? And so what did they find? Uh, who talks about the marks of our Lord? It was clear, the marks in his hands and feet. Where do we find that in scripture? Well, there's of course the passion of our Lord. And then here's St. Paul mentioning it. He says he's got the stigmata, the marks of our Lord. That's when we, the, the church began to put two and two together, right? And realize, could St. Paul have been the first stigmatist? It's not known for certain, but I, I think it's, it's a pretty, um, I, I think it makes, makes uh, plenty of sense. Uh, so St. Francis, um, uh, since St. Francis, and, and it's, it's fitting, this is the Feast of the Stigmata. There are over 350 uh, legitimate, like, um, what do you call it, credible claims of stigmatists, over 350. But St. Francis was the first. He was the first one. It's like our Lord, you know, when he says that out of his treasure he will bring new things and old, this was a new thing that the world hadn't seen for 1,200 years. But after St. Francis, 350 more followed, right? 350 more stigmatists. Uh, so some of them, right, would be um, St. Francis of Assisi, St. John of God, St. Padre Pio, and then a handful of other uh, men. There's only 40 men out of the 350, or, yeah, out of the 350 stigmatists, 40 of them are men, the rest are women. I'm sure that means something. I haven't thought about it too much, but that, that, that does mean something. So Francis of Assisi, John of God, Padre Pio, the most famous one, uh, recently, uh, Catherine of Siena, Gertrude the Great, Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, Margaret Mary Alaco, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, St. Rose of Lima, and Rita of Cassia. And sometimes, like with St. Rita of Cassia, it wasn't the full stigmata. It wasn't like the five wounds in the hands and the feet and side. It was a thorn, uh, a wound in her forehead, like the crown of thorns. 
And so occasionally you'll see that with some of these stigmatists. It's one of the marks or some of the marks. Some of them had scourgings on their back. And sometimes it was invisible. There wouldn't be actual physical marks, but they would feel the pain. And in, in, in I would say very many, if not all, all cases, it was always worse on Good Friday. Right? It was always the worst. Uh, so, um, and people think too that the, the, the doctors can't explain the phenomena of the, the stig stigmatist, especially with the Saint Padre Pio. Um, and they say, well, plenty of people have, have faked it, right? There are these, the, and there are actual confirmed fakes, like it wasn't true. It was completely explained by medical science. So, yeah, you know, the whole thing, right? It's all, it's all baloney. There's a bunch of fakers. Well, the fact that people have faked it, all it does is give us proof because the, the phenomena is not the same. So those who uh, were, uh, we could say, uh, not authentic, almost always were suffering from some kind of mental problems. It was psychologically induced. Uh, they were imbalanced, neurotic, crazy, incoherent, uh, almost all the cases of, of, of those who were faking it. On the other hand, those actual stigmatists, they were like running monasteries, you know, uh, um, writing books, uh, writing, telling the Pope what to do, this kind of stuff. Like, they were extremely capable. It was Catherine of Siena. So, the, the, the stigmatists were not mentally imbalanced, right? You can't run a monastery, you can't run a, a convent with, you know, dozens and dozens of, of, of monks and nuns and not be capable, right? And they write brilliant uh, uh, books. These are not, the, these are not the, 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 the works of people who are psychologically imbalanced. That doesn't explain it. Furthermore, the wounds of the stigmatists uh, never would become infected, although they, and they would remain fresh for weeks, sometimes years, for the case of Padre Pio. For a wound to remain fresh and not heal, and also not to become infected, that's in, like, like impossible. Uh, furthermore, the wounds did not, uh, they didn't smell, they didn't fester, in fact, they emitted a pleasant odor. And um, sometimes the wounds, like they would appear suddenly, okay, I mean, that's not remarkable, but they would heal suddenly. That is remarkable. Uh, they, would, they would appear and reappear. And most strikingly, I think, to me, this is kind of like, I don't know, I don't know how you would argue after this point, uh, the blood that would come from the person wasn't the same blood type as theirs. It was a different blood type. Uh, how, how do you explain that? <clears throat> so for all these reasons, um, you know, we, we have these stigmatists. And, you know, the account, I would like to do that. I would like to, to read the account of St. Francis himself and how the first uh, um, stig uh, stigmata was received. And as I mentioned, it was the year 1224. It was two years before his death. He, he was um, 40, 42 or so years old. And his, his health wasn't so good. He'd been doing a lot of fasting and penance. Uh, and he was on this mountain, uh, Mount Alverna. And he'd been there, he went there with two other friars. And they were doing a 40-day period of fasting and prayer leading up to the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel, September 29th. So it's during this period uh, that St. Francis has a vision. And they have these little cells. So there's this, this mountain in Italy, and they've got these little caves or cells. And they all individually, these, these three men here, they stay in their cells, and they pray. And then they come out together, and they come together for prayer. They'll read the office together. They'll read the breviary. They'll do matins, lauds, you know, the, the monastic um, offices in common but then they'll go out on the mountain on their own. So this was their um, uh, custom, we could say. So um, one day, uh, St. Francis has a vision of an angel, and this is a few days before the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, and one of the other monks sees it. And St. Francis comes down and says, okay, don't, you know, and he talks a bit about the vision, but says, you know, what our Lord told him, and his heart was filled with, with, with uh, the flame of love. And so that was a few days before the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. Well, on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, St. Francis has another vision, and this time he clearly sees an angel uh, with six wings, uh, two above, two below, and two to the side, but the angel is, appears to be crucified on a cross. And as St. Francis is, is looking at this vision, he uh, sees in his own hands uh, the marks of nails forming, these holes forming in his hands, and the, the, there's a round wound on the front, and on the back, there's a kind of a a longer wound, like, like as if the nails were being bent back on the back side of his hands. Same thing in his feet. Also, likewise, in his side, uh, he feels a wound and, and blood uh, runs down his, his uh, uh, cloak. Uh, so St. Francis has this vision and, and receives these wounds, and, uh, uh, but when he comes down from this mountain, from this vision, it's the time for common prayer with the other monks, the two other monks, and they know something's not right because he's hiding his hands and he's, he's walking very uh, painfully. 
and he's leaving traces of blood on the ground. And they can see the blood on the side of his, his, his tunic. So they don't ask anything, but they know something strange has happened, some mystical experience, and he doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, because, you know, this, this is always the mark, too, of authenticity. The saints don't want anybody to know. Who wants, uh, who wants their intimate conversation with, with their beloved to, to be public information? Nobody wants that. And that's the mark of the saints. It was a very intimate experience with Christ our Lord, a vision, an angel, and, but he couldn't hide it. So much to St. Francis's, um, uh, we could say, uh, against his will, to his consternation, even his humiliation, he had to explain the vision and, and show them the wounds. And so from that day forward, uh, one of the monks, his name was Brother Leo. In fact, that's where we get this account. Brother Leo wrote down the account because he was with St. Francis. Uh, this monk, Brother Leo, would dress his wounds. Every day, he would take care of his wounds. And St. Francis, he was still fasting and praying and doing all of his exercises as much as he could. But every day, he had to have his wounds cared for. And there was only one time during the year um, when St. Francis would not allow his wounds to be uh, dressed or bound. And that was from uh, a Holy Thursday to... Um, uh, Holy Saturday. He, he would not have them bound. Uh, that only lasted for two years, though, because uh, uh, two years after this, St. Francis would, um, uh, would depart this world to enter the next, and that was the occasion when the Superior General of the Order of the Franciscans wrote a letter uh, telling everybody about the wounds of St. Francis. Uh, so um, there's actually an excellent book called The Little Flowers of St. Francis. It, it doesn't sound real, but then neither does neither do these accounts of the stigmata, right? But we know by faith that this is trustworthy. So I'd highly recommend that, the, the Little Flowers of St. Francis. It's about the account of, of Brother Leo and St. Francis and uh, the, the leg legacy that St. Francis left behind. His just unbelievable superhuman virtue, because that's what this is. This is proof that God is present in the world. <clears throat> Uh, now, the lesson, you know, we can draw from this, I was really thinking about this. Um, sometimes uh, we just have to sit back and let Christ wound us and realize that it's a mark of his love, right? It, it, we, we desire to be like Christ. We desire to be united with Christ. And it's, it's known, even by pagans in the world, if you really want to get to know somebody, suffer with them. When two people, two strangers, when they go through a really a difficult event, a traumatic event, they can become lifelong friends from shared suffering. And so often, that is why Christ allows us to suffer. He doesn't want us to, he's not, he doesn't want it to happen like directly, just the suffering, but he's like, you have a chance to suffer together with me. And he's always right there next to us. Christ is always right there suffering with us. And if we don't perceive it, the, the fault is ours, right? It's like, it's like, I don't perceive it, but Christ is there. That's why I always tell people, suffering is like a gold mine of wisdom. If you look for wisdom, you'll find it. If you look for Christ, you'll find him. That may take a bit of digging, but he is there. And, and in the state in the world today, uh, the, the, the church is receiving the stigmata, right? The church is being crucified before our very eyes, right? She's being stripped of her garments. Uh, she, she's being wounded in her hands and feet. Uh, the church is not able to exercise the power she should be able to. The church is not able to, to go the places she should be able to go, right? The, the church is, is, is covered in scorn and spittle <clears throat> and thorns. Uh, this is our Holy Mother Church, and so many of us were confused. We're like the apostles. What's going on? How could this be happening? I think we just need to realize and sit back and say sometimes God is going to allow himself to be wounded, and we can't stop it from happening. And so we shouldn't try. We shouldn't sit here and just be horrified and incensed and outraged and indignant at what the bishops are doing or what the bishops are not doing or what we're having to suffer, and I can't believe this. Uh, I think we actually can believe it. The church is, is, is suffering. Um, and I, I don't think it's no accident, right, that, that, that uh, St. Uh, Francis of Assisi was the first one to receive the stigmata. And who's the head of the church right now? A man named Francis, right? While well, the church is, is receiving all these wounds to her body. I think that's no accident. Just like uh, Caiaphas, right, made a prophecy is expedient that one man should die on behalf of the people. Uh, God can use any, any, any kind of symbol he wants, all right, to, to symbol, when he wants to symbolize that something is happening. Uh, so I think um, we can be actually very much at peace uh, with what's happening in the church. Uh, if if the, the, the church, the mystical body of Christ in the world, it's fitting uh, that the bride of Christ suffer even in the same way that Christ himself suffered. Uh, mystically, of course, and so, uh, like I said, we shouldn't be surprised, and I want us to be really be at peace. We can consider this a prolonged Lent, a time of sorrow, a time of suffering, a time of, of offering our sufferings to Christ, 
And, and if we do that, uh, we will be suffering with Christ. We can be like those, those holy women at the foot of the cross. We can be like St. John, just being there with our Lord, uh, compassionating him, knowing there's nothing we can do. We, we just have to wait it out. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.